Hi, I'm Ruth Quaid with the City of Greeley Water Conservation. We're here tonight to do the second in our series of landscape lectures. The presentation tonight is called Basic Landscape Principles, and it's, it's designed to work with our Life After Lawn program, but I'm sure anyone will get benefit from it. Our speaker tonight is Lauren Wilson. She is with Straightforward Designs. She is a local design art, um, landscape designer, and she's going to walk you through so that you're going to have a successful project. Thanks, Ruth. Good night. Good evening, everybody. So tonight we're going to do basic design principles life after lawn. So we're going to start with basic design principles after lawn sprinkler systems. Where does the sun go? Zones, measure twice, cut once. Tree root systems, pathways, hardscapes, design balance, and ideas. So first we'll start with design principles. Um, and when I have a client that comes to me and says something like we want to do design, I want to use life after lawn, this is where we start from. Um, this is the first style. We, we just come to an agreement about the layout. So we're going to take out all of this lawn, as you can kind of see, and this is the shape we're going to go for. We're going to have a rain garden coming through. So whenever you're starting to design, it's really great to use Google Earth or something like that to get an image and get measurements and start seeing what works best for your lawn. This design over here, we took out all of the lawn, extended the concrete patio, made it much more homeowner friendly and a ever blooming drought tolerant yard. This is, oh, I don't know what just happened. There we go. Um, so, so starting whenever you want to do a landscape design or landscape project, um, the first thing you need to think about is the sprinkler system. Are you going to cap the sprinkler system? Are you going to convert it all to drip system? How do you want to handle that? Because that is going to take up a huge chunk of your budget out straight away. Sprinkler systems are just expensive. It's easy to do. It's just a lot of labor work to get it started if it's something you want to look at. So for this yard particularly, we started here on the left. This is all the lawn, not doing great, didn't love it. Um, the old lawn was watered 10 minutes every other night. The new yard will be watered five minutes weekly. So, and these homeowners are very, um, plant savvy. They really had this at their other property they owned. And so they're really excited to um, update their yard and get rid of the grass. And to me, it looks so much better than the lawn. Yeah, maybe I can go to the next slide. Hold on. Next slide, go. Next slide, go. Okay. So this is the ex existing sprinkler system. So you can see where life after lawn even cutting out half of your grass is, is beneficial if you're trying to save water, trying to save money in this way. So these were her original sprinkler heads. There's a lot of them. And to think that that would go off 10 minutes every other night, it's a lot of water to keep that beautiful green lawn. And if you see, this yard has a slope. So that was the other problem with this design is they knew that water was just draining out and um, they were just wasting money because it was literally draining out here, depending on the night's water. So we went from that, oh, come on, to this. So one, we leveled up the lawn enough that we could still have good drainage, but not so much that we're losing water to the hill. Um, and then we capped all of the sprinkler heads and we tapped into oh go back tapped into one and ran our drip system through and off of that one line so now you can kind of see the pattern we did with this this obviously had to be capped over here and we had to just make it one whole line um right here 
And then these down here are completely no water because they're, they're so drought tolerant. The homeowner's fine with watering them every once a week is really what they're going to need. Um, so just, it's a lot about learning what everybody needs to be happy. And um, this yard was a little difficult because we had so much shade, but you can see how getting a Google image and really paying attention to your lawn will be the first big step in success with transforming a lawn to a garden like this. So drip irrigation, utilizing existing head placement. So I kind of said that earlier as we used one of these heads over here, tapped into it and ran our drip system from that. Same thing with over here. Um, two options when you're first thinking about this, either you can cap your system like I did with that first design you guys just saw, or you can or you can just water it by hand too. If it's small enough, if it's something you enjoy, by all means, don't feel like you have to switch ir landscape irrigation if you if you don't need to. So these are my two favorites. I love, they're kind of hard to find and they're expensive, but I love them, the tractors, and then get a timer. Gosh, they're so handy, even with my garden. I have a timer set up. I just make sure it's on and it does it for me and I, and I love it. Um, a good reel is worth the money. If this is something, those plastic ones will break and rot and then you're mad and then it just ruins your whole day. So spend the money, get a good, where is my thing? Get a good reel and a good hose. This is how I water a lot too, is I love these horse buckets and these retractable hoses and a good sprayer and they just coil up so nicely in that when you hand water. So um, these are two really good setups for if you want to hand water, if you don't want to spend the money on a sprinkler system remodel. And if you don't want to do the drip, you have to cap the whole system, drain it, flush it, and then don't turn that system on. Um, but your sprinkler guys can definitely help you with that more. So here's a good example of drip. You, so you can see where the water is. You don't have to have all these admitters here. Um, I would probably just have them here. I'm sure they're gonna fill in. So things to think about too, is you have all your line, your admitters, um, but they do directly water your plants and you just need a little bit because they're so direct. Um, design principle two, where does the sun go? I have this come up a lot when I meet with clients. They they have the best of intentions of buying all these great plants and they plant them and it's all great. And then they all die and they don't know why. And then they're calling me. Um, really pay attention to where your sun is. If you cannot put a shade tolerant plant in where it's gonna get six or more hours of sunlight. Afternoon sun is hotter than morning sun. So you really need to kind of think about where is the sun? Where does it hit? Where is my hot spots, my cool spots um, to be the most success? So with this design, we know that in the back it's hot. So here's my red yucca, my California fuchsias, my spireas. Those all love the heat. And then you, we know that the shade is going to be sitting here. So right here, is my bleeding hearts, my spotted needle, stuff like that, that, that likes the cool and would prefer it stay shaded all day long. Um, now you will see hydrangeas back here. A lot of people say, oh, well, they have to be in, in dead shade. No, they can take some morning light because it's cool. It's not hot. They cannot do the hot. So a lot to learn about plants, but I'm here to help you if you guys need anything. Um, again, where's, where's North, South, East, and West, because that's going to help you a lot in determining where your sun gardens are, where your half shade gardens are. Whenever a plant says it can take partial sun, this is a good, I don't know why my mouse keeps this apparently. Um, this is a good place to put those plants. And then when they say full shade or late afternoon sun, this is it. So Keep that in mind, read the tags before planting, or you know, it really has great um, options for gardens in a box. There's stuff like that. Um, I love those. So zones, another thing when I'm first starting out in landscaping a, a client's house, we talk about their zones. What do you need? 
what does this space have to give to you to make the family and function? So this is a good example of, I just got the measurement for the property, drew it out. Um, Oh, I did that. And then we talked about where's our walking zone? Where does the client want the walking path? Where does the client only want the water? Where is the sun? Where are my hot spots? Where are my cool spots? Where do we need the patio? Where, you know, all the questions need to be answered first. And then you start filling in with the plants. So um, we got that. And then we decided, okay, drip system is going to be the best. This um, design is actually getting installed right now. So I can't wait to add that to this. Um, we, it's a big lawn, it's a big yard, but they don't want the grass. They're from Las Vegas. They don't, they like the garden look. So we um, extended the patio. We made the dog run, super drought tolerant, no fuss. They're going to have a clover lawn. So we have very small drip system. We just have water there to get them established. Once these plants are established, we can turn it off. Um, it's just while we're there, we should just put it in. So we have this, oh my gosh, where did my mouse go? Okay. Um, the drip system comes down and then this is where we have the most emitters. So we'll have the most emitters down here where, and it's also sloping. So we have good drainage and everything. And this is where we want to make sure that we have the drip system because that's gonna go in first and then we'll fill in with that. Um, and then afterwards, we have all the plants to fill in. And then we can really think about where, where do the emitters need to be? What size of emitters do, we, do these plants need? And that's kind of some of the details I'll give the installation companies down the road if they need my help with that. So, um, but also with zones, you know, you have your sprinklers, but you also have your blooming zones. Like the landscape before I showed you, it had a blooming zone. So something was blooming in her yard consistently even in winter there was a lot of winter interest in it um, again she was really into gardening and needed an HOA document um, submitted and I'm much quicker than she was so she um, had me do that but it's an ever-blooming garden um, is something I get asked about a lot so you have your blooming zones and and that can also be communicated in the design um, your sun and shade zones know where they are, your walking zones, and where do you want your privacy? Where, where are you gonna sit? Where are you, do you want privacy? Do you not want privacy? That's a big question I always get asked, or I ask clients when we start designing. Um, what's existing now? What do I need? What does the homeowner want? You know, rose garden, curved walkway are always a, a something that comes up. So ask yourself a lot of questions when you're looking at this. Make multiple drafts. Um, and just keep asking questions and answering those questions as, as best you can for everybody in the house. I always try to do um, designs with husbands and wives because the wife wants one thing, the husband wants another thing. So I always encourage you guys to be together and to decide what's the most important. What's the number one objective in this, in this property and going from there. Um, remember, you know, I have, I have clients that are um, want these flowers where they're bulbs. So remember in fall, you'll need to plant bulbs. Um, and then springtime is when you can do your spring flowers and then fall like mums can be planted. So knowing when plants can be planted is also a good thing to remember. Um, don't get frustrated when you want a blue spruce and you measure and you look on the internet and it says this, and then you look at this one, it says that, and it throws you off because it does for me <laughs> a lot when I'm working with different, different trees that I don't know a lot about um, or haven't seen full grown here in Colorado. So um, my best option is to, is to find the middle. Find the middle and make that your best decision. Don't spend too much time stressing about, well, this says five feet, this says three feet, we'll go to four feet. Give it four feet length and width and you're gonna be pretty good. Um, but you know, when we're going from 35 feet to 20 feet, that's a huge difference. So going in the middle of these is my best advice for dealing with something like that as a roadblock that you'll hit on this path of landscaping. Um, if 
you can, when you buy your house, you should get a plot plan. This is so handy because it literally shows you your land that you own, where your fences can go, where sometimes they'll even have utilities. If you have to have a utility people come out and they give you a sheet like that, keep it, keep it. Those utilities aren't moving because you need to know where you're digging. So pay attention to that. And um, you can draw this out real easily. Um, and come up with a nice design and, and make multiple copies and see where your shade is, see where your sun is, where's your walkway, where do you want to take out grass, but your plot plan is an important thing to have. Um, one, then this is kind of the next step for me once I have the plot plan or the Google image and get measurements is I start drafting it, um, start playing with shapes, start playing with textures, and then, you know, you put your plant size in and you find the middle plant size because, you know, the internet tells you five different sizes. Um, and you just start building and then you can def define who's blooming at what time, how big are they gonna get? And knowing, that's another big thing that I have when dealing with clients is somebody 20 years ago, planted a tree and didn't pay attention to the size and now it's too big or it's taking up this and you know it's always heartbreaking to take out big trees so unless they're hurting stuff which we'll get into that later too um here's another design i did um and just it helps the problem we had here was the wife wanted to convince the husband to put a patio in the front they had just bought the house, it's, it needed love. And she's like, I just want him to see like what this could be. Um, Cause she really wanted to sit out there and watch the sunsets um, because it's west facing. And again, pay attention. Cause we know what's gonna be, it's gonna be hot, hot right there. Um, but she didn't care, she, want, she wanted it right there. So we did that um, and it just gives you a good view of other options you can have. Um, back here, I had another client that really um, had a lot of existing stuff and didn't know what it was. So we just had to label it as existing and she wanted to know the space that she could really use to fill in. And they were gonna put the hot tub over here and wanted my opinion because again, husband had one idea, wife had another. This made the most sense to me. You have to remember your flow. Where, where's the most comfortable? I didn't feel it was most comfortable to walk out on the lawn, maybe in dog poop and try to climb here. And then we have the neighbor right here. So to me, this really made the most sense. So sitting down and drawing out a couple options is always a great thing. Um, your root system, please don't plant aspens. They're horrible. They only last 10 years and their root systems do this through your lawn and ruin your lawn. And the only way to fix that is for us to come through and tear apart your whole lawn, till it, get out as much of the root as possible, add amendment to it and re it. So yes, they're $20 trees, but they can cost you $2,000 really quickly, if not more. So think about the root systems of your trees, look at them up, read about them, think about where you're gonna put these things because the root system can be a huge problem within 10 years. Um, this is what they mean by tap roots. So 3% of trees have a tap root. Most, if not all, have a plate root, which they want to come up. And if you're not watering the trees properly, they'll really come up to find water. And if you don't want that in your lawn, if you don't want that by your patio, if you, you know, don't want to trip over a root like we've all done, um, think about the trees that we put in. Here's some great example or, uh, examples of tree root problems. Poplar, uh, popular honey locust trees still need their root systems considered. They're very popular um, right now because they, they're great. They're, they grow fast, they get big, they shade, not a lot of leaves, they're great. But I still, whenever I'm designing, I put them 20 feet away from the house at all times. So that will literally give the tree 20 feet from my house to ever have the root system come near it. So um, 
these can all be fixed. They're just expensive fixes. Well, I don't know why we're doing that. So, and this um, is something that we fix a lot. What we have to do is take out all of this concrete, break it down, hurt the root system because we have to dig it back out or fill it back in, whichever we can do with the slope and reconcrete. So think about that. Um, these are some methods I like to do when we have to have a tree somewhere or we really want to be careful about the lawn. This is what I suggest clients to do to their trees. Um, bury a pipe down there and make sure that that root system is getting the, root, the water in a direction that we want it. We don't want it to have to find water up here. We want it to know that the water is down here and that's where we want it to go. Safer than sorry. Um, I wish they did this near city sidewalks more so we wouldn't have to fix so many sidewalks, but that's okay. Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you have those pictures with the off the pipes? Yeah. Don't, you don't have to okay. The camera. So that appears to be going right underneath the tree, but it's over Besides. to the sides. Mm -hmm. Okay. I just want to make that clear for people. Yep. You might want to run two and put them to the side of it mm -hmm. so that it's not interrupting. Yep. Okay. Yep. And especially if, you know, you can kind of see, I, I know that this is an apple tree. In orchards, they do this um, because they need more water to produce those fruits. So if your tree is drought tolerant, you probably don't need to do two of them. But if you're if you your heart is just set on a willow or something like that that needs a high amount of water, then this is something I definitely suggest doing with you know two pipes and they're just on the side of it and it dumps water and helps. And even with like again, they use this a lot in orchards, this style, because they have such little um, saplings that it gets them started. And then once they're established, once they can really get on the regular system, then they'll take out the pipe and move on. Um, design principle number six, pathways and hardscapes. So this is one of my first things, you know, we need to focus on when we start our design is where are we walking? How do we want to walk? What's got to, what's going through this? Are the dogs running here? Is the lawnmower coming through here? What's, what's this path used for? So that we can do it once and not have to do it twice. Um, probably installing can be a great investment for your property. Materials can be chosen based on all of these things, cost, durability, you know, maintenance. Um, to qualify for the um, life after lawn, it has to be a permeable base. So allows liquid. Um, and and we'll just to that. clarify, they could still do a paved area. It just won't be included in the rebate. Yep. Okay. Um, so classic Colorado flagstone, dun, dun, dun. Everybody loves it. It's easy to install. It, it can be brought to your house in a pallet because yes, you're gonna need that much. Just spend the money and get the pallet brought to your house. If you're gonna do a walkway, save yourself in your truck um, some heartache. Um, so this would, this would qualify for the life after lawn because water would run through it. Um, it's easy to install, it's homeowner friendly. Weeds will grow through this. And where's my thing? But you can always plant backfill them with thyme is very popular. Um, steppables, you can find those at Fort Collins Nursery Bath, anything like that. They're called steppables. They're meant to be stepped on if it's a high traffic area. Um, and they can be really fun to do. And there's, so you know, like four different colors you can pick from. So it's a fun, easy, homeowner friendly option is flagstone. And I love how wide this is because I really feel like you could get a lawnmower through that and not be fighting it. Or even two people walking side by side. Yeah. Um, breezeway, this is not my favorite. I'm gonna be honest right out the gate. <laughs> it is very popular right now. I just don't think it holds up as well as I would like to. I would rather invest the money in concrete and have my walkway done. And I never have to fix it ever again. Um, I feel like breezeway breaks down. I feel like you shovel it, it gets thrown in the, in the mulch. You can compact it. And we do do that a lot where we come back and we compact this. Um, I just think 
it's not always worth the money. And, I, and it gets in the rocks and just becomes a mess. So, but it is very popular right now. It is very friendly, um, homeowner friendly. Again, with the flagstone and this, you really need to pay attention and learn how to um, do it correctly. You know, you really need to do your base correctly and tamper that in and spend that time getting that base started. So when you backfill, it all settles correctly and nicely so you don't have these big um, divots. So um, weeds will grow through it. It will, but easy to pull through. I can tell you, they. I can pull weeds out of this stuff very easily, or it's easy to spray too. I don't always love using chemicals. It's not my favorite, but it's easy to spray. So um, again, it's it's not my favorite for um, high traffic areas. Um, pay attention to slope. I've seen a breezeway be completely washed out because of rain waters that were too hard for it. Um, you know, if this was me, I would definitely invest in concrete edging right here because it's going to hold it in so much more. So if you don't love concrete, if it's, if it's, it is very expensive. If you don't want to pay that, maybe think about using concrete edging to help keep everything in um, and keep your mulch in. So. But other than that, it's 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 light, it's easy, it it'll pack, it'll it'll stay if it's a not um, too high traffic area or too big of a dog running on it. It's an easy material to use that is cheap. Um, my favorite concrete. It's a lifetime product. It has multiple options. Um, definitely costs more, especially when you start getting into the stamped and the stained and all that. But classic concrete um, is always. For me, a good investment in a home because it, it, it's a lifetime product and it's easy to clean. Um, but it's not permeable, so it would not be included with the life after lawn. But again, like Ruth was saying, if, if you do want to do concrete, it just doesn't come off of your rebate cost. So um, pros and cons of manufactured stone. I love manufactured stone. I think it's so pretty. There are amazing catalogs that can just make these dreams like this come true. Very expensive, very quickly. Definitely have to have, um, I, it's, it's not a, it's not really homeowner friendly. You really need to know what you're doing when you're messing with something like this. Um, so I would definitely um, hire a, a preferred contractor to install something like this. Again, not permeable, so won't work for life after lawn, but man, isn't it pretty? So here's an example of pathways that we really need to kind of think about in another way. This is a mountain home design um, that has came to uh, my company and we're still trying to work out the logistics of it. Maybe it'll happen this summer. Um, this is what she wanted, stairs like this and a pathway like this. She's on a mountain hill. We, we can see her slope is quite big right there. So, um, and a lot of snow, this is up in, Lor in Livermore. Um, Got to think about your snow, your your especially after this winter, we all have to think about our snow and ice and where does the ice build up and what material works right now. Breeze will melt off easy and it'll, and, and you can shovel it, but you'll shovel it into the grass, you know, and you'll find it in the, in the spring. So if this was, if I had all the money in the world and got to do everything I would want to do, um, I would totally do heated concrete with lighting and railing because man, it would be dark up there. Um, for most budgets, com, com, composite decking, there we go. People don't really talk about this as using this for a walkway, but in this scenario, this is exactly what I would love to do. Um, less labor, we can get the material up there. Um, again, lighting and railing, it's too dark. If I had to leave at four o'clock in the morning to go to work, I want a nice lighted pathway in the middle of the mountains. Um, you know, bears, bears and mountain lions, people. So um, that's what I would do with the money instead of those big hard rocks, those big chunks. She wanted, you know, four inch slab, 
flagstone steps and um, it, it's where we haven't figured out the logistics of how to get that up there. So here are another good examples of walkways. Um, this homeowner has a little dog, little kid, just wanted lawn, just needed to get it in. The house was brand new. He couldn't really put the money into the concrete right now. So we just, um, so we just did breeze, black breeze walkway all the way through, extended his driveway so he could park one day when he's got extra money, he'll concrete it and it'll be easy to remove or to go over it. Um, so we just did breeze all the way through and he has his trash can areas and walkways. Um, this homeowner though had a ride on lawnmower, as you, if you can see in there, um, it's 67 feet by 61 lawn. This property was huge. Ah, go back. And so we had a big ride on lawnmower. So we needed to have concrete path to go from the garage out and down to go mow this lawn. And then again, the concrete to come to the front and mow because it was a big property. Um, so just there, how these walkways and the entrances and exits of your home are important. Um, this homeowner didn't want, really it was all about the grandkids. So she wanted a double deck. And as you can see, we have the first deck that the home came with. It actually, we were, we extended it out another eight feet because it was so small from a new build, um, moved the stairs and gave her a platform deck. So she could have two spaces, but then it was so such a small yard. Um, and she wanted so much for the grandchildren that we kind of had to get creative with our levels. Um, so under her first deck, she has another sitting deck that will go onto her small lawn. Um, she didn't want grass. She didn't really need anything. Oh, 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 I don't know how I keep doing that. I'm so sorry. She wanted cut flowers. So we just planted cut flowers. That was her cut flower garden, boom. Uh, no maintenance, but blooming these quints um, hide the neighbors. So we have columnar scotch pines. There's a lot of really neat columnar trees, um, more than aspens that grow just as fast, that give you just as much interest and they're great. Scotch pines are one of my favorites. So this is very low maintenance, very drought tolerant, nothing really too much to it because this whole area is going to be a sand play area with a 22 by 13 swing set for the grandkids. So they all look different, but they all have what that family needs to be successful in that yard. Hardscapes, um, so fun. Um, you know, you can add your hardscapes with your stones, with your pergolas and hot tubs and your decking and then um, it's always fun to add into the design um, fabrics and stuff and kind of have a theme of or style of the, the yard and backyard. And I love it when the house style goes with the backyard style. It all flows very nice. <laughs> um, print, design principles, so balance. We talk about balance in design. Um, there's so many. So, you, you know, and it's defined differently by everybody. Um, to me, for, for me, it, it's even, um, which is why I am a landscape designer because <laughs> it, it makes my OCD so happy. So um, here are some of the most common styles. Um, sorry, this is a little bit blurry, but everybody kind of knows heavy on one side and then just as heavy, but broken up um, is the symmetrical easiest form in the landscape principles. Here's a great example of a straight walkway compared to a curved walkway and what that does with the landscaping and the style. Like, I think this is probably more the style of this home, maybe saying it's maybe in the seventies. Um, that, was, that was really in those globes like that, um, where this is probably more of the nineties look. So, Think about that, play with that idea um, and your walkways and paths and trees. 
So design principles, so like the first, we'll say the 1970s house, it was even on both sides. It had the same symmetrical look um, as like the 90s one, is that what I called it? Uh, 70s was, had that one big tree and then the little shrubs on the left. Um, and also had one big tree and then just one as an even balance. Uh, ornamental grasses are very big right now. They're great, they're drought tolerant, they give winter interest, they have texture, they're so fun and they're coming out with more every year. Botany is not stopping ever. <laughs> they come out with so many, I can't keep up. Um, these are the most probably popular one. You know, Blonde Ambition right now is really popular. You guys see it everywhere. Um, great winter interest and easy, low maintenance drought tolerant, texture, all the right things, and the color. Um, with grasses comes maintenance. They will look like this through winter. You um, hope you see a bird eating the seed heads because that's why we want to keep them too, to help the, the neighbors. And then in spring, so about right now, um, you would start to, my mouse keeps going, um, bundle them up and take, I can't think what the, tool is called right now, handsaw, handsaw um, and chop them off and ta-da, done. And you're ready for, and then you don't have to touch them again for another year, drought tolerant, easy. Some are, some do need more water than others. Again, look at that. But like these big miscanthus that we have here in these pictures, they do need a little bit more water, but not, um, not that I wouldn't consider it in a drought tolerant yard. Um, deciduous shrubs are my favorite. They give you everything. Oops. They give you everything you want. You get spring, summer, fall, and winter interest. Um, the golden current um, gives these beautiful berries and color. And then in winter, it's just got this nice circle shape, really pretty. Coney Easters are amazing. These red berries stay all winter long. Birds love them. Um, and you know, of course, the, the beautiful pines. Nobody likes junipers anymore, but there is a place for a juniper in every yard, <laughs> in my opinion, because they just are so pretty in the winter and they give great habitat. Uh, color balance, I love to do this with clients. It's one of my questions I always ask with clients, what's your favorite color? What color do you wanna see? Do you want to use color therapy? That's a thing. Um, I can't think of what it's called right off the top of my head. But um, so we would do all white um, blooming flowers or all pink, whatever. And um, I do this a lot with annuals too for clients, plant out their whole patio in all white. It just gives it a really stylish, clean look um, when you have color balance. Um, a lot of the time we, I usually try to stay with two colors at the most, maybe three, depending on if the client, you know, depending on what the client wants, but we try to stay in the shades and then it just looks so nice when the lilies are done blooming, this is blooming over here and it's all the same color feel throughout the season. Um, so wrapping it up, things to ask yourself, um, what are your three design goals? Is, is your goal to figure out what's going on through the system at your house? Is it to add more rock, less grass? Do we want to focus on a shade garden or have something fun like a rain garden? Um, and all the other questions we came up with during this slide. Um, when dealing with the trees again, where is your plumbing? Um, how do we want to water? Do we budget for the sprinkler system remodel? How often do we want to water? Are probably top questions um, when you starting when starting this process. Um, where does the water go? Can we make the water go into a different place? I love rain gardens. They are so fun. Um, I love rain barrels. They're great if you if if you don't need that all going off. You know, by all means, use a rain barrel, and then. Um, you know, knowing what, where's my, there it is. Um, knowing where your, your pipes are is very important when planting trees. And um, hopefully they're away from your piping. Um, 
and more things to ask yourself, you know, where's the sun and shade? Um, color of the house is something I always bring up to clients because if you have a pink house like this and you do gray rock, it's fine. It's your house. You do whatever you want. To me, it would bother me. I would have to, because it doesn't match. It doesn't flow. I would want it to match. Um, where do you live? You know, are you full south? facing house, full north facing house. Maybe we don't want to have a walkway on the north side of the house because we can slip from the ice that never melts here in Colorado this year. So things to think about and how big is your yard exactly? Again, that plot plan comes up um, and measuring it and using Google Earth and, and making sure that um, you have your measurements correctly because we don't want to invest in a $300 tree to have to cut it down in five years for $2,000. You know, so we really want to think about um, making good choices and investing, investing correctly. Um, more questions. Do you want to block out any views? Is there neighbors? Is, do we need shade? Where do, are the kids going to play? You know, where do we walk? Where do we need access? And have we met our three top goals in this design? Um, and then we'll go to questions. Here's my, and actually my email is wrong on this. It's S fldesign.org. So sorry about that. And I'll have to read a couple questions from the chat. Um, we have the one about the aspens. Um, do you want to elaborate any more on the aspens? A couple people ask about that. Um, how do you get rid of aspens? So yes. when I have clients come to me and we have aspens that have died, one, we have to cut them down immediately. If we can afford to grind the stump down, worth every penny, but it's that's the easy part. The easy part is getting them down. It's the next step because those roots now are going to shoot off little babies. So then I come through and I cut the, the little seedling babies and I just get a little bit of Roundup on a Q-tip and I'll touch them and just maintain them through the season. Just keep touching them a little bit every month with a little bit of Roundup because what that we're just got to start killing that root system. Um, again, that's why I do not want aspens ever because they are not meant for here. They are they're meant to make a grove and it's supposed to die and make this ecosystem. And it does. We just not the ecosystem we want in our little house yard here in northern Colorado. <laughs> so that's how I get rid of aspens. Um, I think that is a very common problem, but then there are the people that want to keep the aspens, but then they're shooting up all over in their lawn or the beds that they want to take out the lawn and plant. So I just think you have to stay on top of those suburbs. And when they, when the tops start dying, that's when you cut them down. Do not wait for that whole thing. I have seen an aspen go completely out of the root, fall on the house. I mean, they can be very dangerous. They're just not meant for down here. And that can happen with snow, yeah. wind, or with, you know, those heavy spring snows that we sometimes get in March. Yep. Or, um, you know, occasionally we do have a deluge of rain. Yeah. And, and aspens, if they're dying, get them out now. Get them out while they're standing because you don't want it to fall. And they can fall at any minute because yeah. they're trash trees. They really are trash trees. Down here on the prairie. Yeah. <laughs> we go and enjoy them in the mountains. Yes. And, and they're meant to make groves and they're meant to make fallen trees and habitats for, for animals up there for a reason. Not to mention they get all kinds of diseases. Diseases, yes. And you can spray them and shoot them with all these things. It doesn't work. They're going to die in 10 years anyway. So yeah. just don't do it. <laughs> Save your money. <laughs> okay. How can I find out how much space I need for a spring snow crab? And I think you already answered this kind of. That would be considered an ornamental tree. Mm -hmm. So I would say it's probably going to stay in the neighborhood of 25 to 35 feet spread. Mm -hmm. So um, keeping it 20 feet away is what you said in the presentation. Mm -hmm. Away from the house, probably away from driveways too. Yep. Because crab apples do send up those. Most roots. trees have that root system. Yeah. It's, yeah. So I'd say, and get a good catalog and keep in mind that if you're getting it from back east, you want to look at catalogs from around Colorado and the or western. Go to our area. wonderful nurseries that are here, Eaton Grove, Bath, you know, Fort Collins, 
they, they can really help you. And they, there's so many, like when it says a spring snow crab apple, you know, make sure you're getting that spring snow crab apple, that exact one that has the exact ticket that that nursery stock person says, you know, that is a lot of people will move trees around in nurseries and you think you're in the right row and you're not, and they don't look at the tag and then they come home and they just plant it and it becomes a problem. And the spring snow is nice because it doesn't create or it doesn't keep, uh, put on apples. So, yeah. and keep in mind too, that it's called spring snow because it's white. Most crab apples are pink or purple or that range, but it is white. So if it's in bloom, that's a good key too. Yes. Yes. It'll have a couple blooms sometimes. But yeah, keep it, you know, if you, because before you dig, you need to know where your plumbing is. So keep it 20 feet from that plumbing, 20 feet from concrete, um, if you can, if you can at all costs. Uh, and when she says plumbing, she means both the irrigation system lines and your water and sewer lines mm -hmm. as well. So always call before you dig yes. to get those utilities marked. Yes. I think this last question here is for me, um, any classes that are going to help with specific plants that do well in sun, partial sun, and shade. So I have Ross Shrigley coming from Plant Select. He's going to talk about um, all kinds of plants in Plant Select, and he can address a lot of that. If you um, go to the Greeley Landscape Lecture page, greeleygov.com slash landscape lecture, which is where you signed up for this class. If you go back to previous years, I have one in there for um, Amy Lentz from the Extension Service did one on planting in dry shade. People think that shade has to be wet. You can plant a lot of plants in dry shade. And a lot of our natives, well, not a lot of our natives, but some of our natives will go in dry shade as well. So those are classes. Also, you mentioned the rain garden. We're going to have Jessica Thrasher here at, our, at the presenting on how to build a rain garden for a homeowner. Yeah. So that'll be it's a great way to get the water diverted off of your yard. Yeah. If you And those plants in the soil clean that water before it goes back into the system. So that's a really great um, it's mutual fun. benefit yeah. between the plants and the water and the soils. And if you're going to have a yard, have a fun one if yeah. you can. <laughs> yeah. And HOA can't, I mean, we have this a lot where people think they can't do zero scape or life after law and stuff like that because of Covenances. HOAs. That's yeah. not true. State of Colorado has a law. I can't tell you which one it is, but it's true. And they can't tell you, no, you can't zero, zero scape your front yard or can't take out all of the grass. You can. It's state approved. You may have to um, meet with the architectural committee mm -hmm. or their landscape committee, however yours is organized, but they cannot outlawed yeah and they can't find you yeah so just work with them create a good design which is going to benefit you which yes. is going to benefit your neighbors your neighborhood your community and make your HOA happy the better these look the better it is for all of us yeah it makes the process go a lot faster I can I can get HOA approval within two days sometimes just because I have gone through all of the documents made sure every point that they want made is on that document the first time and so we don't have to pay twice and I think that's a good point too is if you do have a professional landscape or design I mean um the HOAs can be much more willing than if you go in with a sheet of paper where you have a bunch of scribbles yes yes and then and and they don't a lot of them want an example of the of the rock you're going to use and a picture of the flagstone you're going to use and stuff like that so when you can present that to them already on the piece of paper already all their boxes are checked immediately um, the process goes a lot faster and they're pretty easy to get along with for the most part their bark is much more than their bite so all right well I want to just thank you again for doing this for me Laura yeah I really appreciate it and um there's our contact information why don't you say your um email one more time just so they have it. My website is sfldesign.org. I, I, I missed that one, but there's my um, phone number and my email. You guys are welcome to use that. And then if you want to look at some of my work and more of the stuff, again, sfldesign.org. Thank you guys. Have a good night. Thank you.